Hello and welcome to the National Press here. Bonjour et bienvenue au Théâtre National de la Presse. Uh, je m'appelle Elisabeth Thompson. And with us today, we have Green Party leader Elizabeth May. Ms. May? Thank you. And thank you to the National Press Gallery and the Press Theatre. I want to start by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Golden Lake. And I also, since this is my first public statement in about 10 days, uh, in that time, I, we lost a very dear parliamentarian colleague in Montréal, Belanger. So I want to again express my sympathies to his whole family. And I'm also very mindful that today is the fifth anniversary of the loss of uh, a great Canadian, Jack Layton. And I want to extend again my condolences to Olivia, to his family, and to all members of the NDP family, because I know this is, after five years, still a very keenly felt loss. Now, to the reason that you're here with me today, and I, I know I'd love to launch into a description of the climate crisis events of the summer, the many reasons that I have always been honored to serve as the chief spokesperson of the Green Party of Canada and our role in Parliament and across Canada as a party that never loses sight of the issues that really matter. But I know you've, you're here to find out what I've decided about my own future. I want to thank everyone across Canada who has written me. I have been, I, of course, I was away, as you all know, away from internet. Imagine that. It is possible on Cape Breton Island. And I wasn't reading the stories as they went by. I see there's been lots of speculation in my absence from internet about whether I plan to join some other political party. So we can start with that. That was never even a consideration. But I was overwhelmed to read so many letters of support from members of the Green Party, uh, from leaders in our electoral district associations and supporters who are not members from across Canada. And media commentary that made me feel as though I'd, you know, sort of like Tom Sawyer was suddenly attending my own funeral. It appears I am much loved. I, it's, it's, it's surprising to find sometimes in politics. I also was very touched by other members of Parliament, uh, colleagues in the House of Commons from other parties, uh, government benches and opposition benches, who sent me very touching letters of personal support and encouragement. So I did have reasons that I think it was attractive to step down, and I'll, I'll tell you what those were, but first I'll tell you that I have decided. Uh, je vais rester comme chef du Parti Vert de Canada. Je suis heureuse avec cette décision, et je suis vraiment um, heureuse d'avoir l'appui du Conseil fédéral du Parti Vert de Canada. We had a late night meeting last night, made even later by a delayed arrival of my flight back from the Maritimes with the Federal Council. The Federal Council has passed a series of motions giving me their full support and, and a path forward that allows us to deal with the recent difficulties the party experienced and to focus on what really matters. Now, why was I really very tempted to step down as leader? One is very operational and transactional. Uh, the highest order of authority in the Green Party of Canada is our membership when gathered in a convention or a meeting of any kind. That's, that is superior to the Federal Council's level of authority. As leader of the party, I actually have no specific powers other than appointing a shadow cabinet and deputy leaders. I'm not in charge of the party and it would be completely impossible and inappropriate for me to push back on any decisions made by members. So, the way I could trigger another chance for members to look at policies arrived at in the August convention was to step down. That's one thing I could do that operationally caused another convention to happen, to choose a new leader. But really another compelling reason has turned into the reason that I'm staying. A very compelling reason for leaving was I felt in the work on the electoral reform committee, would I not have more credibility with the Canadian public in saying, we need to get rid of first past the post if it wasn't constantly mentioned that it was my party or me personally that stood to gain the most among the different parties in Canada by going to proportional representation. In other words, I've been struggling for some time with whether or not my own conviction that having a fair voting system in which every vote counts and in which politics in Canada shifts from being winner take all to being a more consensus based system. Would I not have more credibility in making the, that case if I was not doing so as leader of a party that stood to benefit? Uh, in fact, I, I, one of the reasons, and uh, the major reason that I feel I need to stay on as leader of the Green Party of Canada is that we have now created 
quite accidentally, what might be described as a teachable moment. As a party, for reasons that were unrelated to any specific motion, there was nothing nefarious in this, but we did two things as a party before this convention that we had never done before. One was we decided that we no longer needed to send all the policies back across Canada for an online ratification vote. Now, there's a good reason to have an online ratification vote because our conventions are not funded. The members who show up are the members who can afford to show up. So any time you hold a convention, the geographical location where the meeting is held will determine a lot of who's able to attend, which is why we'd always had an online ratification vote to ensure that all members across Canada had equal access to the decision making of the party. And that was a decision taken in 2014. I'm, I'm still not clear the reasons why that was voted to remove that ratification process. But I think in hindsight it was clearly a mistake. And also, in the 2016 convention for the first time ever, uh, we had decided to try out Robert's Rules of Order. Now, I have to say I was inattentive to this change. I spoke against it on the floor, but I thought, well, we can try one year of a change, see if it works better. But consensus decision-making works better than winner-take-all decision-making. It will work better for the electoral system of Canada, and it worked better for the Green Party of Canada. So what the... what what I've decided is that the reasons for staying are far more compelling and I have such I'm very and again I have to say I'm very touched by the numbers of letters I received and the number of people across all party lines who urged me to stay on as leader the job I have right now as a member of a 12 member committee studying how Canada should change our voting system has to be the focus of all my time and attention between now and December 1st that was one of the reasons that I thought stepping down would help me focus my attention on the Electoral Reform Committee. I now feel very confident that the party's federal council and our shadow cabinet that will all play a role in looking at a process that reassures us as a party that we haven't strayed from our values, that we will stick to consensus-based decision-making, and we will ensure that any decisions and policies that were reached that lacked consensus in August are revisited at a special meeting of members. Now this is all now off my plate. The council and the executive will determine the details of when and where and how a special meeting will take place. There's, uh, the council is uh, looking at some options. I can now focus on electoral reform, but making the case very strongly that if you want good decision making, your best decisions come from working together until you find your common ground. That is what a study, and this is an extraordinary coincidence, that, that later today, before the Electoral Reform Committee, the world's leading expert, and I know there are a number of experts, but I would have to say that Professor Arndt Leibhardt is the world's leading expert in this. He did a, a study, a 36-country study, which is basically all modern democracies, <laughs> looking at the electoral results from the Second World War till now, and he clustered them under two different systems. He didn't call them first past the post versus proportional representation. He called them consensus-based systems versus majoritarian oppositional systems. Somehow, completely by accident, the Green Party of Canada stumbled into our last convention using a majoritarian oppositional system for our own decision making. But we are in our very bones a party that believes in consensus basis decisions that bring everyone together. We are returning to those roots as a party as I hope to go across Canada working with 11 fine parliamentarians on this committee with me hoping that we can come to consensus as a committee and present to Minister Monsef on time December 1st our recommendations to fix our voting system. Enfin, je suis vraiment heureuse d'avoir une résolution avec le Conseil, Conseil fédéral du Parti vert du Canada Je suis vraiment heureuse aussi, et c'est toujours un grand honneur de travailler comme chef du Parti vert du Canada, et je reste maintenant, et je reste toujours comme chef du Parti vert du Canada, avec l'appui de la grande majorité des membres du Parti vert du Canada, et aussi de mes collègues dans le Conseil, Conseil fédéral. Alors, thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. First question, Michelle Zilio, Globe and Mail. Uh, thanks for taking questions today, Ms. May. Uh, are you concerned going forward now that your members and, and voters across Canada will question you, question your desire to be leader, given that you 
publicly said that this was something you didn't really want to do. You told us that. <laughs> well, yes, Michelle, I, I'm uh, perhaps to a fault, and perhaps I can be faulted, for being candid about the fact that this is a, a very difficult job. And I love the fact, uh, this is why I chose the Green Party, this is why I'm not attracted to other parties. I love the fact that the Green Party walks the talk of grassroots engagement and the leader of the party is not the boss. That is the essence of the Green Party of Canada's philosophy. And Green Parties around the world operate in the same way, committed to the same values. So when you're the face of the party, of course, you're blamed when things go wrong and you don't have any control over them, so it may have even been things that you argued against. But that's the nature of the work. Uh, I don't know that I could do anything else to be more effective on the issues that matter than by staying as leader of the Green Party. I have to say I didn't enjoy being executive director of Sierra Club either. Uh, being in charge of organizations is a very tough gig. There's, especially in the case of both the, Green, the Sierra Club and the Green Party have in common, that the control and running the organization is in the hands of members who are democratically elected to a board or in this case a federal council. So it's a difficult job, uh, but I'm very committed to the model of service leadership, which is to say I work for our members, I work for our electoral district associations, and I work primarily as a member of parliament for Saanich Gulf Islands for my constituents. So for the first time ever in the last 10 days, I've had to struggle with whether my sense of duty to my constituents was in any way threatened by my duty as leader. And I feel very confident now that the two are reconciled. I can fully serve the members of my constituency, the citizens of Saanich Gulf Islands, while serving as leader of the Green Party of Canada. People may question that. Uh, it, it's, it, would, it, would, it wouldn't be unfair to imagine that, that uh, being leader of the Green Party of Canada is something that someone else could do better. I don't, I don't doubt that for a minute. If someone else wants to do better, as I've told you before, Michelle. But I'm very, I would, I'd be happy to step aside. But this is a decision not just for the moment. This is a decision that uh, I think the party needs as we build our strength and as I work on electoral reform and we prepare for 2019, I, I think the greater likelihood is that I will lead the Green Party of Canada in the 2019 election. But I'm more than comfortable with the idea that I might not. So that means speculation may swirl, but that's, it's, that's the honest answer, so I'm kind of stuck with it. You also told us that members um, joined at the convention just to vote for the BDS motion. Mm -hmm. Well, are they didn't join concerned? at the convention. They would have had to join some time in advance. But there were new members who were attracted to that. That's true. Are you concerned there could be a revolt from them if you are now reconsidering this motion? It's not one motion that we're reconsidering. We're looking at our decision-making process. We've always, for 33 years, made decisions by consensus on really tough issues, even on right to life versus right to choose. We've made decisions by consensus. And we've never before put an issue that was hotly disputed to a vote, up, down, winner take all. It's not really part of our culture to do that. And there were not, it wasn't just one motion, there were a number. And if, I'm not sure at what point the motions that council passed last night will be shared with everyone. Perhaps you have them already. But what the council is asking, and, and c'est pour le, le, le cabinet fantôme, le groupe de, pour moi, les, les critiques uh, de, des enjeux partout au Canada, pour travailler ensemble, pour trouver uh, les, les, les autres idées pour Pour, pour trouver un, un position, une position consensus, de consensus avant l'Assemblée le, 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 uh, extraordinaire. So the shadow cabinet will work on trying to find consensus. I'm not the least bit worried about what happens when we go into a meeting with consensus decision making because there's goodwill on all sides. There are good people on all sides and the goal of ensuring that the members of this party, we, we will never deviate from the fact that the members of the party are in charge. And we've also had, you know, we, we're very clear from results that are coming into the party uh, from members that there is a very strong desire to return to consensus-based decision making and revisit any of the motions that were passed with strong feelings on either side and with a sense that, that we, didn't, we didn't try at all to achieve consensus. That's not 
that's not the way greens around the world operate. Uh, they're, they're very elaborate consensus driven processes in every Green Party around the world. We let ourselves down, and I, I take blame for that myself. I, I, I voted for going ahead with Robert's Rules of Order. I thought, okay, we'll try one time, see what it's like. Well, now we know. And, and, and the, it, it's, again, the larger message around our voting system for Canadians is in microcosm what happened to the Green Party. The way you make decisions changes the kinds of decisions you make. And your political culture is affected by the way you make decisions. Christy Kirkup, Canadian Press. Hi, thanks for taking our questions. Um, you didn't actually mention the BDS acronym when you were uh, speaking to us. Obviously, uh, you've been very open about the fact, though, that you've been personally heartbroken uh, mm -hmm. about the passage of the resolution, uh, the fact that you strongly disagreed with it. Um, so how do you think that the party is going to be able to heal itself as a result of this um, divide that's been exposed as a result of what happened with BDS? And, and, and Parliament denounced BDS, and you have firmly said you oppose it. So what's your stance yeah. today? Well, I certainly don't support the resolution, the, the motion that was passed in Parliament. And unfortunately, the timing of that vote changed. It's been reported variously in the last little while that I voted for it, voted against it, or abstained. None of the above. I intended to vote against it, uh, but the day of the vote was changed. And ironically, I was at Dalhousie Law School in Halifax in a pre-scheduled discussion of electoral reform. So I, I missed the vote, but I made it clear on the floor of the House in debate that I opposed it, because I think it's quite wrong to pass uh, motions in Parliament, and now I see Chris Christie's doing it in New Jersey, to say that it should be illegal or demonized to advocate for a social change movement that has legitimate goals. Right? But where, I've, where I was heartbroken wasn't about the BDS motion. I was heartbroken to find myself, and I, I think I said to someone, I can't remember whom, that I felt as if I had suddenly dropped into a foreign land. I was, uh, we were at a, con a Green Party convention, and no one was saying, come on, folks, we know we can do this. Let's find that compromise. Go away, come back, find some wording that we can all agree on. That was, for me, that, that was the heartbrokenness. It was, it was not the way we'd made decisions in the past, and it left a room divided. We've never done that before. And I'm quite confident that the people who sponsored the motion for BDS, the people who opposed the motion, working together, and, and many of those same people are in the shadow cabinet, mandated to find some compromises. With, and this is the thing about consensus. It takes time. You can't rush consensus decision making. Um, so like first past the post, in my experience, Robert's rules of order is fast, efficient, and leads to bad decisions. You spent the last week in Nova Scotia on vacation, obviously thinking about your own political future. So can you just describe the emotional experience that you know you went through in the last week? What was on your mind, and how did you reach the ultimate decision you reached today? Well, it, I didn't really reach a decision. I came home firmly of the view that there were two courses open to the party, and I'm, I was equally comfortable for my personal life with either one but I needed to know what federal council thought. So I really didn't know until after 11 o'clock last night what I'd be saying to you at 10 o'clock this morning. Honestly, didn't know. The process of being home was really interesting because I, I live on Vancouver Island, obviously, but my family home is on Cape Breton Island. My brother works at McLeod's campgrounds, and he comes back and says, well, the campers are pretty worried. A lot of campers coming up to me saying, tell Elizabeth she's got to stay. Really? What's going on? So <laughs> it was kind of amazing to find that while I was offline, uh, there was a substantial amount of support for me staying on as leader that managed to permeate um, McLeod's campgrounds. And I'm grateful for the support of those folks, too. I had people stopping me as I was making my way back to Ottawa in airports and everywhere saying, oh, we hope you don't, you're not leaving. So um, it, emotionally, it was very gratifying. I miss my family a great deal. I have to say the hardest part of working over 90 hours a week, as I do routinely seven days a week, most weeks of the year, is that I don't get much time uh, to be with the people I love the most. And I got that for a week, and it de definitely helped me feel quite confident in my skin of what I needed to do. But to do it, I needed to know that federal council would approve a path forward that could allow me to say, okay, all those things that happened when we forgot about consensus decision-making, 
We're, we're going to get a chance to do those again under our Constitution, respecting the grassroots democracy of this party. I'm not participating in that debate. I'm out of it. I'm going to focus 100 percent of my effort on electoral reform and, of course, whenever I can, on pushing the Trudeau administration to get rid of Stephen Harper's old dated carbon target and have a climate plan that actually gets us to what we committed to in Paris. Uh, those two things are all I can do between now and December 1st. Margot McDermott of CBC. Um, Elizabeth, what did you hear from the council, though, <clears throat> last night? What was it that they said to you that made you feel comfortable in your skin to stay on? Well, it's, it came to a question of support and unity. Uh, the, the council overwhelmingly wants me to stay on as leader. They, they know, I am mean, very candid with them, as I just was with you all, that maybe by 4-2019, there, there can be a transition to somebody new and stronger. That's, that's possible. But overwhelmingly, uh, they want me to stay on for at least the next year to 18 months to make sure we, are, we get an electoral reform system that is fair and proportional. That's everyone's top of mind goal. And this became for a lot of us a worrying distraction. Not to say it's not an important issue, but there are a series of issues, not just one that was dealt with at the convention. So the council, basically what, what uh, led me to stay on was their willingness to, to, to accept a, a proposal that I was making that, look, the way out of this under our Constitution isn't to have a leadership convention. That's a long way off and that leaves us with a lot of uncertainty for a long time. This opportunity that was pointed out to me by another member of council, uh, you know, I, I should know our Constitution inside and out, but I think maybe you won't be surprised to know that I don't read it every night. My, I read the Constitution of Canada more often than I read the Constitution of the Green Party of Canada. And the opportunity to hold a special meeting that would enshrine that the grassroots is always in charge. There were some other options that I don't think any of us found attractive for changing resolutions through some other means. We're a grassroots party. The members have to be engaged. And the willingness of council to trust me that a consensus decision-making process would lead to a united party. And there's some who are still kind of dubious. They think for, they, they like Robert's rules of order. And obviously on that, we probably have more disagreement within the council on this question of Robert's rules of order versus uh, green rules for consensus than on other policy issues, which is, when you think about it, kind of funny. But uh, it's, it's a critical issue to me that we return to consensus-based decision-making, and Council completely supports me in making that effort and in encouraging me to go forth and focus on what starts at 2 o'clock today again, which is the evidence before the Committee on Electoral Reform with a, I don't know if you've seen the, the schedule for our committee, but it, it, it's a killer schedule. And, and we're going to get to every province and territory and listen to thousands of Canadians and accept briefs from more and all the input from all the town hall meetings that MPs are holding and come to, I hope, a consensus decision of our committee and report by December 1st. That's a daunting workload, and Council fully supports, and this is what really made a huge difference for me, that I should do that as leader of the Green Party, not as the only Green Party member of Parliament and not leader. They want me at that table as leader of the Green Party of Canada, working to ensure we have a fair voting system. Just to follow up, though, about the BDS uh, resolution, is it possible then, are you saying that you, uh, the Green Party could go back to that decision but do it in a consensual way which might bring a different result? That is exactly. Council's motions include that what we're, that we're, we're going to revisit, uh, where the purpose of the, of the new uh, special uh, meeting that's been called, that will be called and there will be details to be sorted out and that's, that's been delegated to the executive. But one will be the first focus of the special meeting of members will be to focus on whatever the committee has reported. The special meeting of members, not to get too down into the weeds, but it requires a 90-day notice to all members to do one. And that basically puts us at either just before or just after, at its earliest, it could be later, but it puts us at least most likely after December 1st when the committee report is in front of us. So our number one focus as a party, as we determined uh, at the uh, at beginning of 2016, what's our goal for this year? Electoral reform, electoral reform, electoral reform. So the special meeting will have its top priority on focusing on whatever the committee has recommended, expanding and enlarging on it, and using that opportunity to educate more Canadians about 
and, and I, as I stand before you now, I don't know what the committee is going to recommend. I hope it's going to be really great. But we will talk about electoral reform at that special meeting. The second will be to look at all decisions from the 2016 convention that, that were passed in a majoritarian winner-take-all approach that left us far from consensus. And any emotion, there were a number of motions we just didn't have time for, including some emergency motions. They could also be dealt with under, by consensus decisions. And that we would also, at that special meeting, review our own policy making process and determine whether changes should be made. And then the first motion in that line of how do we change our decision making process comes from federal council itself, saying we need to return to the past practice of the last 33 years of having a confirmation vote by all members online following the, or by mail, online or by mail following whatever a convention has decided. Those were, th those have been our tradition. They work well. So any of the motions, and, and it will be up to Shadow Cabinet to review the records and people's memories of the meeting, because not all votes were recorded votes, but to assess which motions, are, for instance, there was a, a lot of in media interest in putting a tax on sugary drinks. That had overwhelming support. There was no debate. That one, by consensus or by first past the post, that one passed. But there are others where there were divisions. And so the, it'll be up to Shadow Cabinet to decide which motions will be reviewed at a special meeting of members. And they will be reviewed under our previous rules of green rules of procedure. You can still find them on our website. They're enormously complex. How you achieve consensus under green rules of procedure. Melanie Marquis, Press Canadien. Bonjour, uh, Madame May. Le, je sais que le, le, le vote sur le BDS n'a pas été un vote consensuel comme c'était la tradition, mais il y a quand même une majorité d'associations qui ont voté en faveur. Est-ce que votre, euh, vous dirigez un parti qui est divisé? Oui, ce n'est pas la majorité des membres, c'est seulement la euh, majorité dans la Chambre à, à, à le moment, au moment. Euh, parce que nous avons plus de euh, 20 000 membres et les membres ont leur... Euh, leur propre euh, euh, avis de cette question, dont le, la Chambre, dont le, le matin de dimanche, c'est clair que la grande majorité des membres dans la Convention sont, euh, 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 sont d'accord avec la résolution en faveur de BDS, c'est clair. Et c'est pour ça, il reste pour le moment, Le part, le, 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 la politique du Parti vert du Canada, c'est en faveur. Ça, c'est notre constitution. Ça, c'est la décision. C'est seulement si les membres donnent une, une nouvelle approche avec le, le processus par consensus, dans une nouvelle, un, euh, euh, une, euh, une assemblée extraordinaire euh, pour peut-être trouver une autre décision, faire une autre décision, ce n'est pas clair, peut-être qu'il fait la même, la même décision. Mais pour moi, c'est la question de la processus. C'est plus important parce que nous sommes un parti avec les valeurs racinées dans l'idée de consensus. Euh, ça, c'est les valeurs du Parti vert. Et j'espère qu'avec les bonnes volontés de tout le monde, c'est vraiment possible de trouver une politique sur cette question avec l'appui de tout le monde. Ça, c'est peut-être un peu de magique de les processus de consensus. Ce n'est pas l'un contre l'autre, c'est tout le monde ensemble pour trouver les, les solutions. Est-ce que vous le sentez, oui ou non, diviser votre parti? Oui. Qu une... oui, non, je pense que c'est la question de oui ou non dans le processus. Peut-être que je ne peux pas comprendre bien, mais avec une nouvelle approche de, avec consensus, C'est seulement un, un vote quand il était absolument impossible de trouver une solution euh, avec l'appui de tout le monde. Pour moi, je n'ai pas de peur de nous avons les divisions parce que nous sommes un parti avec une grande tradition de trouver les solutions par compromis, par la bonne volonté de tout le monde, pour trouver le terrain en commun. 
vous avez dit euh, pendant votre déclaration d'ouverture que jamais vous n'aviez envisagé vous joindre à un autre parti. Est-ce que, par contre, depuis le Congrès ou dans les jours où vous avez commencé à dire que vous pourriez peut-être quitter, il y a des partis qui vous, qui vous ont approché? Vous? Non, non. Je, personne ne m'approche. Tout le monde… Je pense que les, les, euh, les partisans des autres partis me connaissent très bien. Je suis vert. Je suis toujours vert. Et ce n'est pas une question pour moi de, de joindre les autres partis. J'aime beaucoup mes amis dans les autres partis. J'ai les collègues, les proches qui sont libérales, puis MPD, puis conservateurs, puis bloc. Nous sommes collègues. Mais c'est une chose tout à fait différente. Imaginez-moi dans le parti. Il y a un parti où je peux rester parce qu'il y a les grandes différences en politique. Et ce n'est pas pour, pour moi une bonne idée de joindre une autre partie seulement pour retraiter le, le, le lendemain. <rire> Il y a trop de différences entre les partis. Maintenant, qu'on a lié le devoir. Je sur la question du BDS. J'aimerais ça comprendre. Je, je vois que pour vous, il y a un enjeu de processus, mais sur la question elle-même de fond du BDS, c'est quoi votre position à vous? Je suis contre parce que... Mais je suis, si je suis seulement euh, députée dans le Parti vert et le Parti vert restait avec cette position, euh, c'est seulement un petit parti, une petite section d'une plateforme euh, énorme. La difficulté, c'est pour rester comme chef du Parti vert. Ça, c'est le problème. Pour moi, je pense que les gens dans les mouvements pour le BDS euh, aussi sont les personnes avec les bonnes volontés. Il y a les enjeux importants qui sont ignorés de grande majorité de, de euh, débats en politique ne reste pas sur les questions de les politiques de M. Netanyahu et les choses qu'il a fait qui sont vraiment désastres pour le processus de paix dans la région de Moyen-Est. Mais pour moi, ce n'est pas une bonne idée pour un parti en politique de donner appui vers un mouvement social avec tout leur, euh, qu'est-ce qu'on peut dire, en, en, le, le, le baggage d'un mouvement social avec leur politique. Et c'est une grosse, malheureusement, euh, c'est un mouvement vraiment euh, 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 divisif. Anglicism. It's very divisive, this movement. Mm -hmm. Il y a beaucoup de gens dans la communauté juive au Canada qui pensent que c'est un mouvement contre et uh, contre anti-Semitic. Mais je pense que ce n'est pas un mouvement anti-Semitic. Mais il y a les, les, uh, les gens qui donnent leur appui vers ce mouvement qui sont vraiment anti-Semitic. Pour moi, c'est une question de. Uh, de demander pourquoi c'est une bonne idée, une bonne idée pour un parti comme nous donner l'appui vers un mouvement dehors de nous. C'est un mouvement social, ce n'est pas un mouvement politique. Et je, je, je partage euh, les, les inquiétudes des gens dans ce mouvement, mais je trouve leur solution euh, mauvaise et pas euh, efficace pour la paix dans la région, pour les droits humains des personnes dans euh, les, les deux nations d'une de, solution pour cette région, deux, une solution de deux nations, on doit avoir deux nations. C'est pour appuyer tous les deux. Ça, c'est le, le place où je, je suis vraiment à l'aise avec l'idée que nous sommes en faveur de la protection des enfants israéliens et palestiniens. C'est pour nous les droits humains de tous les deux. Et c'est pour moi, pour ça, je suis comme un, un, un individuel, un membre du parti. Je suis contre cette motion. Maintenant, as-tu un suivi? Ou? Non, ça va. OK. Euh, Manon, euh, Vincent Brousseau, Pouliot, La Presse. Juste deux, deux courtes questions. Première question, pour l'Assemblée extraordinaire, est-ce qu'on comprend que ça va être en ligne et que tous les membres vont être appelés à se prononcer sur cette motion-là? Ou si ça va être la même chose, au fond, que le Congrès, ou ça va être physique, puis peut-être que ça aura le même enjeu? C'est euh, une question maintenant ouverte, je pense. Uh, C'est une bonne idée pour le parti, je, à mon avis, de trouver les solutions avec l'utilisation uh, des technologies pour une participation plus grande que les gens qui, sont pour, qui, qui trouvent que c'est possible de faire le voyage. À, 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 on doit choisir pour une assemblée extraordinaire. Mais quand même, quand même nous avons la, 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 motion, la, la motion ici 
que le, euh, le parti euh, revient au le processus d'avoir un vote après les solutions euh, pour être euh, un vote de validation ouvert à tous les membres après l'Assemblée extraordinaire. Oui, parce que pour l'Assemblée en, en mois d'août, c'est la première fois que nous avons changé les règlements et maintenant, il n'y a, euh, a pas nécessaire d'avoir ce vote de validation. Alors, le, le Conseil fédéral hier soir a décidé qu'on euh, doit euh, tenir encore le processus avec un vote de validation après les, con les congrès, après les, les euh, assemblées extraordinaires. Et c'est pour ça, c'est vraiment clair que la prochaine fois que nous avons l'opportunité de, de débat, de revue, de vote et, et trouver les décisions par consensus, c'est aussi après ça, on doit avoir un vote euh, ouvert euh, euh, pour tous les membres, à tous les membres. Pour ce qui est des prochaines élections en 2019, est-ce que vous, est-ce que, c'est quelles sont vos intentions? Est-ce que vous voulez vous représenter comme chef? Est-ce que vous vous êtes engagé à ça, hier? Ah, je suis vraiment engagé de présenter dans la circonscription de saint lucie de golf comme candidat de Parti vert du Canada. Et je suis actuellement ouvert à l'idée que peut-être je veux travailler avec euh, un, un nouvel ou nouveau chef, mais je suis aussi absolument prête de, de présenter comme chef de Parti vert dans les prochaines élections fédérales. Ce n'est pas seulement pour moi de faire ça, cette décision, et c'est toujours une question de, 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 pour les, les gens dans une chefferie euh, quand est le, le moment parfait pour faire une transition. Je suis claire et que ce n'est pas aujourd'hui, <rire> mais peut-être avant 2019, peut-être. John, uh, John Geddes, uh, McLean's. Your, your emphasis on uh, consensus decision making here makes me wonder what your view is of the work of the Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform. If the committee doesn't arrive at some kind of consensus that includes all the parties, do you think it would be best for the Liberals to step away from their 2015 promise to, to get rid of first past the post? So if there's no consensus of the committee, does that mean there shouldn't be any reform of, of the electoral system? Should that be the, the, the only premise for a reform? I will absolutely hold the Liberals to their promise that 2015 is the last election held in Canada under first past the post, in that they are supported by all those Canadians who also voted for NDP candidates and also voted for Green Party candidates. So we have a mandate, and I believe that uh, the Prime Minister has a mandate where 63 percent of Canadians voted for candidates whose platforms included getting rid of first past the post. Uh, beyond that, as you know, the NDP was very strongly in favor of mixed member proportional. They are now expressing flexibility, which is a good sign if we're trying to achieve consensus. Uh, and if we have substantial consensus, for instance, if three or four parties out of a five-party committee come to consensus, then I think there's a mandate. If the committee fails to come to a consensus that includes at least uh, two or three parties, then you can't call it consensus at all. And I will strive. This is why I want to clear my mind of anything but the work I'm doing with the Electoral Reform Committee. This is a, a wonderful, exciting, and also challenging opportunity to change our voting system. We've been the first parliamentary committee that looked at this, as some of you will know, was in 1921. Yeah, this is not a new idea. It's not the first time that a group of parliamentarians has sat around a table and realized our voting system is inherently flawed, produces governments that could never have the, the popular support to be a majority government if it wasn't for the fact that it's a winner-take-all system riding by riding. So la système de vote majoritaire uninominal par un tour, c'est un système vraiment affreux. Et il y a plus de 100 ans que les députés dans la Chambre de, de communes ont eu les débats sur cette question. So for me, after more than 100, you know, it's, it's almost 100 years that Canadians, uh, Canadian parliamentarians have debated this. It's time to have 
a fair voting system. And holding the liberals to their word includes the words in the speech from the throne, which say, in order to ensure that every vote counts, 2015 will be the last election held under first past the post. That, by definition, rules out any of the majoritarian winner-take-all systems, which are first past the post and ranked ballot. So I think we have a mandate from the speech from the throne to figure out which of the many possibilities and permutations and potentially innovative hybrid system just for Canada will work to ensure that Canadians have a fair voting system which will have multiple benefits, including, as I was saying earlier, changing the way we make, make decisions changes our culture. I look forward to a culture of Canadian politics where complimenting another leader for his or her achievements, for a good idea, is not considered sort of a, a politically suicidal move. I think Canadians want to see us work together more. Changing our voting system to a proportional representation system will accomplish, accomplish a cultural shift away from wedge, dog whistle politics, and towards a much more respectful discourse that allows us to do much more together. No consensus on the committee. The government should still be held to its promise to get rid of first pass the vote. Yes, that's your position. Absolutely, but I, I, I would because it's an election promise. When have we ever said that a political party, which which ran on a very clear platform, it no longer has to achieve their election promise? It, it, in some ways, let me just give a comparison. Um, there were the the liberal platform was very thin on climate commitments, but one of them was we will bring in a national carbon tax. We'll have a price on carbon. We'll put a price on carbon. That was very clearly in their platform. They've now created a process, for which I applaud uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, starting in March in Vancouver for the first time in a decade, bringing all the provinces together to work on a climate plan. And in that process, I know, and I think it's been reported, that in that room in Vancouver in March, it was made very clear to the provinces, well, if you don't agree, and come to consensus as provinces and territories working through this process on how we put in place a national carbon tax, then the feds will go it alone and put it in place. They made a promise. We're going to hold them to it. It's clearly uh, desirable to have all the provinces and territories agreeing. It's lamentable that Premier Christy Clark announced just a few days ago that BC is going to become, uh, well, has become a non-player. We have a great carbon tax, but it's premised, as it was under Premier Campbell, on ratcheting up that tax year on year so it can continue to be effective. It's no longer driving down emissions. Emissions in, in British Columbia are going to go up. That's not climate leadership. So the federal, provincial, territorial climate negotiations, it will be ideal to see them achieve a consensus that is strong, that allows us to blast past the weak climate target left behind by the previous government and actually achieve what was promised by Canada in the negotiations at COP21 in Paris. That would be ideal. But if that process fails, they're not off the hook as a Liberal government to bring in a carbon tax nationally. And Prime Minister Trudeau has acknowledged that. I think on the same, uh, same uh, thought pr process, one would realize it's ideal if our electoral reform committee of minority liberal mem membership, conservatives, NDP, Bloc, and Greens, if we can ch achieve consensus, and I know these are good people. The members of this committee are, not, mo for the most part, very knowledgeable. Some have written about the need for getting rid of first past the post for years. On, in all the different parties that are sitting around that table, we have an opportunity to come to consensus that meets the election promise of the liberal government. But if our committee, and God forbid it should fail, I don't think it will. I don't think it will. I think people will be really pleased and surprised by what can happen when parliamentarians set aside partisanship to try to find what's really in the best interest of Canadians. Because electoral reform is not, in, is not about what's best for political parties. <laughs> it's, it's about what's best for Canadians. I think we can do it. But should we fail, that does not, that does not mean Liberals get to break election promises. Michel Zilio, Club Mail. One more question for you, Ms. May. I just want to be absolutely clear. If after this review process at the special meeting, um, the party is going to organize, if the BDS motion is still supported, you're you're going to stay on as leader? Well, that's too hypothetical for me, I'm afraid. Um, um, 
the reality is that I'm very convinced that with a consensus-based decision-making process, we leave with consensus. And that consensus will be one that we can all support. So I, it's, it's, it's a hypothetical that I find too unbelievable to actually conjure up how I could answer. Are there any other questions yet? Oh, Christy. Just one last question. The resolution, as it's written right now, do you think it's anti-Semitic? No. And I don't think there's anti-Semitic people within the Green Party. The only time in history, you know, and I just mentioned one of the things that makes us very different from other parties, uh, under the Elections Act, leaders of parties are given specific powers to sign off on nomination papers. Only in the Green Party is that moderated by needing a supermajority of the Federal Council if I don't want to sign off on someone who's been duly nominated. The only times we have refused to sign off on someone who was duly nominated was over issues in this category. I'm not going to say those candidates were anti-Semitic, but there was concern. And that's the only time we've exercised that kind of control over a duly nominated candidate from their own riding. So we've taken this seriously for a very long time. Uh, the allegations that somehow there's some kind of group within the Green Party that's anti-Semitic and no, absolutely not the case. And the people who put forward that resolution have in their minds that there are deep injustices being visited on civilians in the occupied territory and they want to see justice done. There are deep injustices done in Tibet by the occupied forces of the People's Republic of China. There are deep injustices happening around the world and human rights in many countries. And my view is that as a party that has as one of its core principles, respect for human rights, that we, and also we're the only party with a core principle. We only have six global green values. One is respect for human rights. One is to find peaceful solutions and nonviolent non -violent solutions to conflicts. Those are very strong commitments of the Green Party. That means I will never be one of those leaders who fails to criticize when a, a government does something that abuses human rights in their own country. I've been very forceful about human rights in Parliament of Canada, and I've not hedged or ducked from saying when I believe that Prime Minister Netanyahu's policies were disproportionate, for instance, in shelling Gaza. I will equally condemn Hamas rockets into Israel as I will Israeli disproportionate reaction and killing children uh, within the occupied territory. That, that for me is uh, a very strong position to take, and we will continue to, to express our support for peaceful resolutions, for support for human rights, and to do it without a one-sided resolution, uh, but one that reflects how we feel as, as all of us together working to achieve consensus. So, yeah, I don't think the people who, I will never demonize the people in that movement, and I think it's a mistake. Uh, and I think the Conservatives intended it as a wedge issue to force the Liberals into an uncomfortable position in terms of the resolution to demonize and condemn the BDS movement as anti-Semitic. I found it very distasteful. I spoke on the floor of the House of Commons and pointed out the very well-meaning and well-intentioned groups that have endorsed that. But it shouldn't include a federal political party that's serious and wants to elect more MPs in the next election. We shouldn't sign on to any social movement that's outside of our, out of our control and doesn't use our language and our values to express a way forward. Okay. Thank you very much. Merci tout le monde.